Nel nome del Padre, Figliolo, Spirito Santo. Amen. Such a separation. Again, so the title of my talk today: "The World Is a School, But We're Not the Students." Okay, the world is a school, but we're not the students. Okay, so there's a there's a popular idea that uh, circulates around spiritual circles that the world is indeed a school, and uh, it's a good idea, and there's a lot of merit to that idea. For one, it's a real step up from the idea that the world is all just a, a random accident, <laughs> that it's all chaos, and uh, it's our job to try to survive the chaos as best we can. You know, thinking of the world as a school makes the world purposeful. That means that all has a reason, that it all has a purpose. There are all lessons and of course in miracles is very clear that indeed the world is not ruled by chance uh, the course says no accident nor chance is possible within the universe as god created it outside of which is nothing so we absolutely have to let go of the idea that the world is somehow chaotic or just a random collision of molecules and that there's any kind of chance or accident happening in the world of course, in Miracles also says all things are lessons God would have me learn. So that definitely lends support to the idea that the world is a school. Everything here is a lesson God would have me learn. Now, if you go with that too far, uh, it creates other problems. So if everything is a lesson God would have me learn, then when unpleasant things happen, then you think God is giving you those unpleasant things because there's some lesson you have to learn or that you know we're constantly being tested by God and you know in my early spiritual religious upbringing you know my Catholic upbringing you know this idea of being tested by God was prevalent so we were being tested by God and then uh, after we passed after we died we would be judged by some sort of divine tribunal of some kind and uh, if we were really, really good and blessed, we would go to heaven. If we were basically good, but passed with some sins on our soul that we didn't have time to confess, well, then we'd have to wait in purgatory until the end of time. And if we weren't good, you know, if we passed with mortal sins on our, on our soul, then we went to hell. Okay, so this teaching, uh, yeah, was a little skewed <laughs> and I'm so glad I don't think I don't know if I ever really bought that at the time but if we think of the world as a continual testing ground where God is testing us it lends itself to that idea and of course the miracles does not support that idea the course says trials are but lessons which you failed to learn presented once again so where you made a faulty choice before you can now make a better one and thus escape all pain which what you chose before has brought to you so yes we do have trials but the only reason we have trials is because we didn't learn the lesson easier before so we didn't learn the lesson easier before and we're actually setting all that up. And so in order to get our attention and make the right choice or the better choice, uh, things get ramped up a little bit and then things become trials. So all of that does tend to support the idea that the world is indeed a school and that we're here to learn. And even when challenging things happen, you know, there's still a lesson to be learned in it, but God isn't sending us the challenge we're manifesting the challenge and we wouldn't have to be so challenged if we were 
more sensitive, we could actually learn the lessons earlier before they became challenging. Okay, Course in Miracles, as most of you know, uh, is a set of three books, even though it's mostly produced as one book today, but it's three books. It's uh, the text and the workbook for students and the manual for teachers. Okay, in the workbook for students, it says this in the introduction. It says the training period is one year. So yes, A Course in Miracles does conceptualize us in the beginning as a student, but it's only supposed to be for a year. And then at the end of the workbook, it reiterates this. It says, yet in the final days of this one year, we gave to God together, you and I, we found a single purpose that we shared. And so there is this idea that, yeah, we're a student and the world is a classroom, but we're only supposed to be a student for a year. And most Course of Miracles students I know have been studying the course for multiple years, maybe even multiple decades. And so conceptualizing yourself as a student of the course after multiple decades of doing it, something's amiss with that idea. And then let's not forget that there are three books to A Course in Miracles, and the third book is the Manual for Teachers. And A Course in Miracles is a training to become a teacher, a teacher of God. So yeah, it's a school, but we're supposed to be the teachers in the school, not the students in the school. Course in Miracles says he cannot claim that title, the title is Teacher of God, until he has gone through the workbook since we are learning within the framework of our course. So there is a framework here and there is a curriculum. We do have to read the text and we do have to do the workbook lessons. But within that framework and within that curriculum, once we have done that, we should be able to let go of the conceptualization of being a student and move into the truth of being a teacher, a teacher of God. Now, many years ago, uh, when I was in college, I went to Cornell University, uh, which is an Ivy League school on the East Coast, and you know, we had this idea, there was this thing called the perpetual student. You know, perhaps you have learned about this. So the perpetual student. So at Cornell University, you know, it was a four-year undergraduate curriculum. And then after you graduated, there was graduate work. And many people did do graduate work. And then you could go for a master's degree. And then maybe you could go for a PhD. And then, of course, there was postdoctoral work you could do. I mean, the PhD usually took people four to six years to do. And then there was the postdoc work that could take more years. And then people would get other PhDs, a second PhD. And so, you know, some people just seem to be perpetually a student. And uh, we used to talk about that as, you know, maybe that's a little problem. Maybe there's a point where you have to decide and challenge yourself and stop being the student. If you look at the picture on the program, it's a, a, an early Adam Sandler movie, and there's Adam Sandler there, uh, a grown man sitting in a classroom with a whole bunch of really young people. I think some of us in the Course of Miracles community are just like Adam in that, in that picture. We're sitting in a classroom with the students and we really should be up in front with the teachers. We should be teaching. Now there's also some teachings in A Course of Miracles that actually talks about the time of learning being over. In other words, the time of a student being over. It says, it is but the symbol that the time of learning now is over. And the goal of the atonement has been reached at last. As we behold his glory, will we know we have no need of learning or perception or of time or anything except the Holy Self, the Christ, whom God created as his son. So there is a time when learning needs to be let go of. Certainly being a student needs to be let go of. And we embrace that we know we're the Christ. And we know our brothers and sisters are the Christ. And it's time for us to start behaving like the Christ. 
Um, a Course of Love, which is uh, another spiritual teaching that many people uh, and many Course of Miracles students uh, embrace and study, uh, talks even more about this, about the time of learning being over. And it talks about, you know, it's the time to really be the accomplished. It's the time to really embrace being the accomplished. We don't have to wait for some strange achievement of some so-called perfection before we can do that. We do it where we are. It's an attitude to bring into who we are. And when we become the accomplished, we become teachers. We're still in school, <clears throat> but we're not students anymore. We're the teachers. Course in Miracles has a lot to say about being a teacher. In fact, it's the whole third book, which is a short book, but the whole third book is about being a teacher. And teaching is talked about in other passages all throughout the first two books. Here's one that says, teaching is done in many ways, by formal means, by guidance, and above all, by example. Teaching is therapy because it means the sharing <coughs> of ideas, excuse me, <coughs> and the awareness that to share them is to strengthen them. And that's early in the course, that's in chapter one. So teaching is done by all kinds of means. It's done by formal means, <coughs> it's done by guidance, and it's done above all by how we conduct ourselves and about how we live our lives. In the teacher's manual, it talks a lot about just claiming the title of a teacher of God, but it also really talks a lot about healing and it actually uh, equates the two. So being a teacher of God is the same as being a healer for God. So teachers are healers in A Course in Miracles. So when we have to open up and <clears throat> embrace being a teacher, it means opening up and embracing being a healer. Some people are a little more comfortable with the healer idea than they are with the teacher idea. I think it's because people really have this idea that they can be a healer quietly and uh, just personally on their own. And teacher seems to imply a little bit more of a, of a public role. And, uh, you know, that may be true, but I think we have to really embrace them both. And sometimes being a healer is a more public thing as well. The truth is we can't know how any of these things play out for us. We just have to be open to it and start conceptualizing ourselves in these manners and then allow the Holy Spirit to dictate what we're going to do with our lives. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from A Course in Miracles, I, I use it a lot, is the slogan for the crusade is listen, learn, and do. Listen to my voice, learn to undo error, and do something to correct it. The first two are not enough. The real members of my party are active workers. So this idea that we can do it all silently without ever being public or vocal or out there with it uh, doesn't seem to hold up with this active doing. Uh, idea that is found again in chapter one and uh, spoken about in the very slogan that we should be embracing for our teaching work which is listen learn and do do something be active workers in the workbook it uh, a couple of times tells us that we should always be asking the Holy Spirit three questions which are, what would you have me do? Where would you have me go? What would you have me say? And to whom? So again, the active doing idea. What would you have me do? Where would you have me go? What would you have me say? And to whom? So, you know, a little today's talk is just really to challenge everybody and, and to continually challenge myself to be an active worker to be open to the Holy Spirit's guidance, which could have me do all kinds of things, have me go all kinds of places, have me say all kinds of things to all kinds of people. And to, you know, let go a little bit of this idea that it's all of something that we do quietly without uh, bringing any attention to ourselves and without anybody knowing what we're doing. 
Okay, so that's, you know, I guess that's the, the main message. And I do want to qualify this a little bit to say that once you do this, don't expect that everybody's going to like you. In fact, you probably have a lot of really good reason to be a little, little hesitant to do all this because generally my experience has been is, well, you, you do get, you know, you do get some positive strokes and they're really wonderful, but you also get a lot of negative pushback that sometimes is really, really challenging. So don't expect all your great teaching healing work to be met with honor and kindness and gratitude and thanks because frequently it is not. And the Course talks about this. It says you make attempts at kindness and forgiveness, yet you turn them to attack again unless you find external gratitude and lavish thanks your gifts must be received with honor, lest they be withdrawn. So <clears throat> there is this tendency to want to withdraw the gifts when they don't get accepted or honored or received in the manner that we are hoping that they will be. And so another big message is don't withdraw your gifts just because people don't seem to appreciate them and appreciate you. Uh, you know, I've, I've had this job, as I said at the beginning, for a long time. I've had it for 35 plus years, and I was, of course, a miracle student for a number of years before that, and uh, leading groups for a number of years before that. And I have always tried to be right out there with what I believe A Course in Miracles was saying, and certainly what it was teaching me. And a lot of the things that I put out there were not popular, and they were not well received. Um, you know, they, some people received some of them well, but a lot of people didn't like it and a lot of people had a lot of pushback. I mean, for years I was talking about how A Course in Miracles just basically didn't support marriage, traditional marriage. It didn't support the idea of monogamy. I talked about that a lot and that was never met too well, but to me that was the message I was getting from A Course in Miracles. And I had to keep putting that out there. You know, everybody's going to relate to A Course in Miracles differently, but I'm a teacher and I'm going to teach what it's teaching me. <clears throat> Nobody has to agree with me, but there's very challenging ideas in A Course in Miracles about not having special relationships, not thinking of people as special, not having special love, not using some people for things that you would not be willing to use everybody. Four. Okay, well, these are very challenging ideas with traditional relationships, traditional commitments, traditional marriage and monogamy. It's a, it's a challenging thing. And, you know, the Course says challenging things. Um, the Course says a lot of challenging things about freedom, and I've been putting that out there a lot lately. And that's getting quite a bit of pushback because I think some of the things that are going on in the world right now uh, are taking away freedom, or they're trying to, and it's uh, you know it's it's an issue I want to talk about. I started a discussion on that large Facebook group that I'm one of the admins for that now has over twenty two thousand members, and uh, that, so early this week, I think on Monday maybe I started a discussion about freedom and put in some quotes from A Course in Miracles and some quotes from Martin Luther King and some quotes from Gandhi and uh, one from Benjamin Franklin, and uh, it's been quite a lively discussion. I looked right before this service, and uh, there were currently 520 comments and replies on that, on that post right now. So, I mean, that's a lot, and I got to tell you, a vast majority of them haven't been positive. I've gotten quite a bit of attack uh, uh, for the ideas that I put out, but you know, I'm a teacher. Uh, I, I accept that the world is a school, but I'm not the student, I'm the teacher, and I'm going to put out there what Holy Spirit guides me to put out there, because I continually do ask the question, what would you have me do, where would you have me go, what would you have me say, and to whom? And I get the response that I get, and I don't do it in order to get praise and gratitude and lavish thanks, because I don't get that. But the, the gratitude that I get for what I do comes from within. And that's the only place that really, really matters. 
Remember, being a teacher is really a very simple thing. Uh, it was in the reading that Reverend Joni said. It said, a teacher of God is anyone who chooses to be one. His qualifications consist solely of this, somehow, somewhere. He has made a deliberate choice in which he did not see his interests as apart from someone else's. That's the only thing that really you need to do to be a teacher. That's what starts you as a teacher. You see somebody else as yourself and you see their interests as your interests. And in so doing, the path gets followed and we just move along from that point. And I believe we all have done that at one time or another. And I think in the heart of hearts, many of us, maybe all of us know that we are teachers and we are doing our best. And maybe we could step that game up a little bit. Uh, being a teacher doesn't mean that you still don't read A Course in Miracles and you still don't do the lessons or whatever. You still don't go to groups, but you're going with a different mindset and a different attitude. Course in Miracles also says, and again, this was in the reading that Reverend Joni read, this is a manual for a special curriculum intended for teachers of a special form of the universal course. So we're Course in Miracles teachers. Yes, there is a universal course, but we've been drawn to A Course in Miracles. And we're here to teach that and to teach that to people. And yeah, there are universal aspects to it, but there are particular specific qualities that it has specifically. And we're here to be a demonstration and a witness and a teacher of those things. So if you've been a student for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, let it go. Be a teacher, be the Christ be the accomplished, represent your discipline, A Course in Miracles, to your friends, your family. Show them the love and the truth and the happiness that it is bringing you. Don't expect that they're going to give you all kinds of gratitude and lavish thanks, but you'll get that gratitude from within, from the Holy Spirit, from your connection with Jesus, from the divine. And you will be helping and encouraging and forwarding the healing of the world. Okay, that's my talk today. Thank you very much. In the name of the Father, Filiolo, Spiritus Santo. Amen. Such a separation. Such a close one Have you been mad?